For around half of the world, the colder weather is long upon us. Last summer, I hand sewed a Victorian talma, and whilst this garment is plenty warm for transitionary seasons like autumn and spring, I needed something a little bit thicker for when it's especially rainy and windy and frigid. The Victorian Dressmaker Volume 2 had this very straightforward pattern to make a cloak, and I happened to have the ideal wool in my stash. A very autumnal, wintry feeling thick tartan. If you've seen my Bushleek video, you probably recognize this fabric. Initially, my plan was to make this cloak, but eventually that got turned into making the Bushleek first, and then later having plans to make the cloak to go with it. Whilst this cloak does have a pattern for a hood, I decided to just make a very dramatic standing collar because something about that just felt more exciting and majestic. Plus, if I wear the cloak with the bush lick, it makes the garment more customizable, as essentially it serves as a removable hood. To begin with, I needed to draft the pattern. The shapes of this cloak are fairly simple, so this wasn't overly time-consuming. It just consists of a cloak body and then the collar piece, all with very simple shapes. I don't often work with patterned fabric, so I had to carefully match all the stripes and lines together of the wool. I felt this was easier done standing up and pinning, that way gravity would help the fabric to fold. I get quite a few comments on construction videos mentioning that I should iron or press my fabric starts, etc. And I can assure you that I always do. I spend a considerable amount of time ironing, I just don't bother showing the process in videos because I film with quite a large lighting setup and it's incredibly time consuming to have to film myself every time I use the iron in a different area. I also feel it might get redundant, but rest assured I pressed and ironed all this fabric before using it. The pattern is cut on the fold, so once the fabric was correctly matched up and secured, I placed it on the ground to be covered with a pattern piece. I ran into a bit of an issue here. As you can see, the pattern hangs off the edge of the fabric, and this pattern piece is without added seam allowance. So I needed to make some adjustments by removing a few inches of width from the pattern itself. That way I could still keep the pattern match the same, but be able to cut the cloak on a fold. After some drafting, folding, and taping, the pattern fit and I could proceed with weighing it down and cutting it out. Due to the pattern being on a fold, I felt it easiest to tailors tack the seam lines, that way they transfer easily to both sides of the cloak, and also I wouldn't have to faff with tracing paper on such an immense piece of fabric. I've mentioned in a prior video why I've generally stopped using the tracing wheel, and this exact type of scenario is a big reason why. Once complete, the tailors tacks were all evenly transferred throughout the entire piece. I flipped over the seam allowance at the top edge of the main cloak piece in order to create some bulk for where I cartridge pleat later on. This just helps to make the pleating more pronounced, but with wool like this that doesn't fray, you can also just cut off the seam allowance and cartridge pleat the raw edge. The pleating just won't be as bulky. The lining I chose for this cloak is one in my stash that many of you have likely seen before used with other projects. It's a Japanese silk that was then tie-dyed in this funky color in the UK, and it was extremely affordable, so I bought a bunch of it to line various garments with that might need a slippier material. Because the silk is so slippery, instead of trying to cut it with a giant pattern piece on a fold, I decided just to lay a length of silk onto the outer fabric, pin it in place as smooth and evenly as possible, and then once set, to just cut around the edges of the outer fabric. This actually worked very well, and I was so happy with how neat the lining ended up being placed. Pulling back the lining from the edge, I took the seam allowances of the wool and flipped them under, fell stitching each side down so that the wool would stay flat. Normally, you could just iron the fabric and skip this step, but with such a thick wool, it doesn't really hold a fold very well, and so it needs to be sewn down in order to reduce bulk. For the bottom of the cloak, the edge is on a curve, so I notched the seam allowance before fell stitching it down. Then I folded under the seam allowance of the silk to the wrong side and pinned it to the tucked under wool seam allowance all around the cloak. For the top edge of the silk, I didn't have the lining go all the way up. Instead, it stops partway up the cloak, so I folded under the raw edge and pinned it to be sewn down too. I went around every single folded under edge of the cloak and sewed all of the lining to the outer wool with whip stitches. Now it was time for the cartridge pleats, which really give this cloak its majestic and swoopy look. At the folded over top edge, I drew two dots, one half inch apart, all the way down the width of the fabric. Then using two waxed long strands of silk thread, I ran two rows of gathering stitches. Pulling the stitches tight, I pleated up the fabric until it reached my desired length, 24 inches, which is the width of the future collar. 
This way the two pieces will match up evenly and I'll be able to connect them. I absolutely loved the way the cartridge pleats looked once they were all gathered. It was so satisfying. Then it was time to make the collar. I drew chalk lines on some leftover wool fabric measuring 24 inches wide by 4 inches long and left an extra inch or so around each edge for seam allowance. Once I had my initial piece, I made a second one just by cutting around the first and then proceeded to flip under and pin down all the seam allowances. Then I fell stitched the seam allowances of both pieces down so that they'd stay secure. And finally, I placed one of the pieces on top of the other, stitching them together to form a collar. I messed up when stitching the collar to the cloak initially. I first decided to stitch the cartridge pleats halfway up the length of the collar, as I figured this would have the best look, but I was definitely wrong. The collar just didn't look right, so after a couple hours of hard work, I had to undo the stitches and instead attach the collar with whip stitches to each of the dips of the cartridge pleats at the very edge of the collar. This looked way better, and I'm really glad I took the time to re-sew this step. Instead of fashioning some type of cloak closure, I remembered about this one antique belt buckle I had in my collection. I thought it would actually make the perfect fastener for this cloak, as it adds to the overall Celtic feel. In some essence, a cloak fastener is basically a belt buckle at the end of the day because it connects two pieces of cloth or material to hold something together. This belt buckle has these loops at the back, so I cut out two strands of wool fabric and wrapped them through the belt buckle loops, sewing the fold down securely. I repeated this process for both sides, of course, and was very happy with how the result turned out. It's going to go here on the collar of the cloak, and it'll just help to keep everything shut whilst also accenting the standing collar. I sewed the wool straps to the cloak body on the wrong side, and now the closure was complete. I wore the cloak outside a couple of times, actually, but I noticed I wasn't very happy with the standing collar. It felt too floppy and not stiff enough. Sadly, I didn't get any footage to show you what I mean, but to mitigate this issue, I decided to create a series of boning channels to add to the collar. Five in total, evenly distributed. I took some scrap wool and cut it into 1 inch by 3 inch strips, then took synthetic whalebone and cut it down to 2.5 inch pieces, later filing down the pointed edges with a nail file in order to keep the bone from snagging any fabric. And finally I sewed the channels down along the inside of the collar. Now the collar could stand properly on its own without bending too much or flopping over, so I was much more pleased with the result. And that's the entire process. This project honestly wasn't too difficult nor time consuming as the shapes were minimal and simple, but I'm glad I'll now have a heavier weight and very warm winter option to wear. And who knows, in the UK, it might even work for some days during the spring or summer. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all on Thursday in two weeks. Mm -hmm.